But don't President you think, Beebe? Yeah. yeah, but we're already doing that to some modest extent with solar energy. Yeah. We have solar, the excess goes back to the utilities. And there's great interest in the legislature in supporting what's called net energy metering, yeah. uh, up to 5% or even higher. Uh, so we know technically how to do this. Uh, it's a question of, of the capacity and costs and all that. I mean, I, th I agree with the, the, what you've laid out, but I don't think it's, it's some indefinite future before we get there. I think we will have this ability uh, to do these things in the, in the not too distant future. It's not priority one. Priority one is doing all the things to get consumer acceptance for electric vehicles, it seems to me. That is priority one. All right, let's go to another question here in the audience, this gentleman right here. Hi, I'm Matthew Mackey. Uh, sort of similar lines, a little more narrower question. In terms of the smart grid, I'm a software engineer, and I know that the most important thing to have when you're going to distribute something is have a standard. That If you've got different standards in different places, those standards die. It's the beta max versus VHS problem. I was wondering if you could address, someone could address just how far along are we on developing standards for the smart grid so that by the time we actually start trying to put a smart grid technology in a car, everyone's agreed on what it's going to be. It doesn't matter where you sell, sell it in the country. It doesn't matter what car it's in. I'm wondering how far along are we on that? I can't speak for the nation as a whole. I can speak for California. I think we're sure. quite a, a ways down the path to having the of standardization here. The hope is that California, by being a pace setter, will then uh, have very significant impact elsewhere, but perhaps EPRI can better address that on a There's national. There's a very recently started national effort on standards, codes and standards for the smart grid. Okay, it's led by the National Institute of, of Standards and Testing, so it's, it's, it, there is, it, we have a ways to go, but I mean there's a very concerted government-led effort to do that. In terms of vehicle-specific things, um, Actually, a gentleman from General Motors is chair of the, uh, of the code panel that's designing the connector and standardizing the connector, and that is almost done. So we'll have one connector for all vehicles, whether they're plug-in hybrids or e-revs or electric vehicles. There'll be one connector. Um, probably for the United States, okay? One connector. But since you can't drive to Europe yet, um, we'll, so we'll, we'll do a very good job within our... <coughs> around North America. We'll do a very good job of So of same standards. problem when you bring your laptop to Europe, you'll have to have a different yeah. plug and all that kind of stuff. So uh, yes. We can always dream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're, we're getting there. Now the, yeah. the standard for vehicles talking... But it would be talking, North America, right? Yeah, Canada, North America. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, the standard for vehicles talking to the grid and exchanging good, important data like how much energy you need and when <clears throat> you need to be charged by and all these other things. Uh, is we're, that is ongoing, and, and we're probably a year to a year and a half away from that. Good. All right, let's go to another question online, and then we'll come back to the audience. Um, this questioner, Ben, says, doesn't it make sense uh, for the Volt to be launched in whatever states offer the biggest tax credits and or the cheapest electricity to the consumer? Um, yeah, we, Brent? we haven't announced the rollout. We'll, we'll be announcing the rollout by state soon. We're looking at the variety of factors, actually. Uh, so our first year won't be a national rollout. Uh, we will be going to uh, select states to, uh, to uh, communicate. We'll uh, make a communication tomorrow about this state, um, where we're sit situated today. And obviously, their leadership uh, will be a lead for us as well. So uh, we're looking at all the factors, quite honestly. Uh, we're talking about the infrastructure. We're talking about the incentives, the economics for the consumers. Uh, it's important to get it uh, seated well in the first years uh, because we want electric vehicles as a category uh, to be a very positive consumer experience. So some of the things you talked about, the five or six uh, visits, we want, you know, we've, we've all learned from this uh, as we're all early on it. And so uh, we'll be looking at each of the states as we go forward and uh, obviously go to a national rollout once we get to full acceleration. The question suggests, amongst other things, biggest tax credits, that's anybody can understand that and that obviously has a, uh, uh, has a is, is an important point but also the cheapest electricity to the consumer that's a far more uh, the response there is far more nuanced actually as I said earlier I mean California's electricity rates uh, are higher than a lot of the adjoining states but if you set the rate structure for electric vehicles off peak at a very low rate which uh, we approved uh, Edison proposal to do uh, summertime six cents and in uh, wintertime I think it's four four and a half cents. Uh, that is a, that 
meets that test. Yeah. Right. The third big factor, though, is, is I think is environmental acceptability and desire to be in a leadership role. And most Priuses are sold in California and, and a very high number in Los Angeles and the San Francisco Bay Area. That's not by accident. The people, this state, through both political Republicans and Democrats, leadership, at least at the executive level, have been pretty much committed to dealing with climate change, greenhouse gases, cleaner air, and so forth. And we have an environmental ethic in this state that makes acceptability of EVs and other things, I think, much more likely than some other places. Right. Well, and, and then, Senator, you, you've been working on other things that go beyond pricing uh, to find these other benefits to someone who purchases an electric vehicle, whether it's access to uh, an HOV lane or who knows, maybe there will be retailers who will say, come and buy coffee at our establishment, we'll let you plug in for 30 minutes for free or, or something. So I think there are a lot of other things that uh, will attract folks in different states. Sorry. All right, let's go to another question here in the audience. Right here, this gentleman. Hi. Uh, Felix Kramer from California Cars Initiative. Uh, for GM question, uh, there's been a lot of discussion tonight about uh, uh, who's going to, who are going to be the first buyers and the rollout and so forth. Uh, a week ago, the Electrification Coalition talked about an end of business as usual scenario in which we went vastly beyond what we expect and we got to 100 million uh, vehicles by 2030. And I'm wondering, the, the Volt was designed to be a Chevy because it wants to give the message that it's going to be a mainstream car. What happens if uh, it isn't just a small niche, and this vehicle sells like hotcakes at the beginning. How are you thinking at, at Chevrolet about how to uh, respond if there really is an opportunity to sell millions of the ve these vehicles much quicker than anyone expects? Uh, you know, I, I think obviously if, uh, if the demand goes up to the level you're talking about, um, I think, I think there's a lot of uh, factors going into the, you know, as we say, gas-friendly to gas-free, and this is in the gas-free kind of category. Um, you know, we, we think we've got a pretty good understanding or where we think the demand will start to shape up, but, but we're going we're gonna to respond as all manufacturers will to as the demand starts to be created. Um, there's definitely a demand for electric vehicles, there's no question. It has been for a long period of time. And we just have to get to the right balance of that supply-demand, getting the cost and the economics and the price, that final E for the consumers, that their economic E in balance. And if there is, we'll be able to respond as an industry to those, those elements. What we've been talking about here today is some of the uh, prohibitors to that, that natural growth. The demand curve in terms of uh, the, getting the cost right in terms of the technology development, having the infrastructure in place for the consumers to meet their lifestyle needs. Uh, those are factors that have to be in play. No different, I'm one of the ones that's very passionate about biofuels as another propulsion source. I mean, to make energy out of garbage is a very, attractive thought. We have lots of garbage in the world today and there's cellulosic elements. There are elements of infrastructure. It fits beautifully with an internal combustion engine and a flex fuel capable engine, but there are infrastructures to make those fueling stations available as well. Each of these have a demand for consumers. And a biodiesel is a very interesting alternative for people that are looking for high torque and highway hauling conditions. So what I would come back to it from a Chevrolet perspective, we want to participate in all of those propulsion technologies. We think electric vehicles will, will expand beyond what we currently see today, and we want to participate in that, in, in, that, uh, in that element. It will not be for all consumers. It will be for many consumers, and some of the things we're talking about today will allow it to open up the aperture of that demand side, and then it's up to the industry economically to supply the supply side. So we're excited about it. We think this is a great future on all of the propulsion technologies, and EV brings a whole new entry for us.